Uh, so the, just to warn everybody, so the key topic of the talk would be geometric measure theory. But since it's uh, usually a quite technical topic and possibly boring, I will try to keep things as intuitive and simple as possible, though sometimes you're going to have to face some GMT. Uh, so this is going to be one of the key words we are talking about. So let me start with uh, a basic example. That's where the whole theory of calibration started. So we are in R4 and we take the standard synthetic structure, the synthetic form in uh, R4. Now as an algebraic object, as a two form, it acts on two vectors. And by, by two vectors for the moment, I mean elements of the exterior algebra of degree two. So uh, is there a pointer here? Yeah. So such an object, uh, it's what I call a two vector elements of the exterior two algebra. And for the moment, this is just an algebraic thing. You can compute the action of omega on any such vector. If you now restrict to what is called a simple two vector, which means a, a vector of this form. So this is simple because you can write it as a vector wedge another one, while this is not a simple one. If you restrict to those vectors here, you can give a geometric meaning to the action of omega. And the geometric meaning is the following. Any simple two vector identifies uniquely an oriented two dimensional plane in R4 through the origin. And this correspondence becomes bijective in the moment you normalize all, or all your simple two vectors to be unit. And by unit, I mean that the area spanned by the parallelogram V1, V2 is one. So in this way, you get a bijective correspondence here. So you can speak equivalent, uh, equivalently of the action of omega on unit simple two vectors or the action of omega on any oriented two-dimensional plane in R4. So this would be what you are doing. Uh, any two vector identify a two-dimensional plane. Of course, the blue vectors or the red vectors are identifying the same plane, but if the area of the two parallelogram is one, then they're also the same as elements of the exterior algebra. So this correspondence we had here is indeed uh, bijective. So from now on, I will speak equivalently of either the action of a form on an oriented plane or the action of a form on unit simple vectors, uh, k vectors of the correct dimension. So let's uh, focus now on the form we have, omega, the synthetic form. And let's make this uh, series of remarks that these things have been noticed by Wittinger somehow implicitly. Then the RAM made them more explicit. And Federer, as we will see later, found a nice way of using them to answer some question in geometric measure theory. So the first observation is that if you, you, you can compare the action of omega on oriented two-dimensional plane to the action of the area form on oriented two-dimensional planes. And what you can uh, compute is that the action of omega is always bounded from above by the area form. So whenever you take a unit simple two vector, so uh, the parallelogram has area one, then the area form gives one on that uh, plane and omega will give you at most one. So this is the first point. And of course, once you have this, you may wonder when you reach equality. When does it happen that omega and the area form give you exactly the same action on a two dimensional plane? And it turns out that this happens exactly when the two dimensional plane spanned by V1 and V2 is a complex line of C2 when you identify C2 and R4 with the standard complex structure of C2. So you can select a special subfamily of the Grassmannian of two di oriented two-dimensional planes in R4. And this special subfamily that I'm denoting by G omega is the set of planes where omega and the area give you the same action. So what you know is that on this special subfamily, you have the same action. And in general, you have this, that omega gives you at most the, uh, what the area form gives you. So putting these two things together, we can uh, observe the following thing. Take a smooth submanifold, possibly with boundary in R4, with the condition that the tangent planes belong to this special subfamily. So by what we've just said, this means that this is a holomorphic uh, variety in, in C2. Then S is a mass minimizer for, the, for its own boundary. So why is that? What we are going to use are these two conditions that we have on omega. So what we want to do is take another surface with the same boundary as S 
and compare the two areas. So let's see how we can do this. So T is the comparison surface, so they have the same boundary. The area of S is, of course, the integration of the area form on S. And by the condition on S, we know that all, the, all of its tangents are exactly the, set, uh, the, the kind of planes on which omega and the area form give you the same thing. So you can substitute the area form with omega in this integral. Now we use Stokes' theorem. Since omega is a closed form, we can obtain that T minus S is a boundaryless three-dimensional uh, uh, manifold. So you can apply Stokes' theorem, and by the closeness of omega, you get that the, the action of omega on S is the same as the action of omega on T. And now recall that omega had the special property that it always, it's always bounded from above by the area form. So you can bound from above the integral on, on T of omega with the integral on T of the area form. And this gives you the area of T. So you immediately get that such a surface S is a minimizer for the area for its own boundary. Now, why was this interesting? Federer's remark was exactly connected to this. So at the time, it was uh, open to ask, an open question to ask if uh, an area minimizer for a certain boundary had to be necessarily smooth or if it could come with uh, singular points. So now consider one or either of these two examples here in uh, C2. You can take the union of two complex planes or you might take a, a, ho a holomorphic curve such as this, z squared equals uh, w cubed. Both of these are holomorphic varieties. You can now imagine that you are cutting this with the unit ball, so you only look at what's inside the unit ball, so you get a boundary on the unit sphere. So let's think of the first case. You can just, by the same argument as before, get that this is uh, an area minimizer for the given boundary. So the given boundary in the first example is the union of two circles, each circle coming from one of the two planes. In the second example, you have that always if you cut with the unit ball, you get a smooth curve as a boundary of a knot type. And you have this curve in the interior, which is not smooth. It's smooth except at the origin. So at the origin, you have a branch point. So you, you can prove again that this is an area minimizer for the given boundary. What you have to use is always Stokes theorem, but now you, the classical Stokes theorem applies to manifolds that are smooth. So you might wonder if it still works with this singular point at the origin. So to explicitly compute it, you actually cut out a ball around uh, the origin. You use the standard Stokes theorem, and then you send this ball to zero and check that the contribution of boundary coming from Stokes theorem there vanishes in the limit. So that in the end, you actually get that you can apply Stokes theorem on this more generic manifold exactly in the same way. So as we will see later on, the, this fact that Stokes theorem works exactly in the same way just by letting the boundary be what you expect the boundary to be is what will be the definition of boundary for currents. Anyway, the Federer's point was that both of these examples come with a singular point at the origin and they are minimizers for the area. So he answered the question that was open at the time by saying that yes, actually, Submanifolds that minimize the area can come with singularity. And of course, Federer was working in a framework of geometric measure theory, so singular points are one of the main objects you have to deal with there. So now we can generalize the whole discussion. Remember that everything we used here was the fact that we have a good comparison of the differential form that we've been given, omega in the previous example, with the corresponding Riemannian volume element of the correct dimension. So we had this comparison, and we have the closeness of the form. Now, these are the only two features we used in the proof of the fact that that surface was a minimizer of the area. And these are the feature we keep to define in general a calibration. So the concept of calibration appeared in its final version in the paper by Harvey Lawson in 82. There is uh, quite a bit of history to go from the case of the sympathetic form we saw before to the general case. There were other examples throughout the years. Uh, this is where the final definition appeared, and they gave a lot of examples and interesting related problems. So as I was saying, we just keep these two conditions we needed. Omega is a differential form of degree k on a Riemannian manifold. What we want is that we can compare the action of omega with the action of the k-dimensional volume element. 
and omega is always bounded from above by the ac action of the k-dimensional volume element. Or in other words, if you take unit simple k vectors, which means you have uh, k vectors that span a parallelotope of volume of k volume one, omega gives you at most one on such a k vector. And then we require the closeness of omega. So this is called the calibration. And again, we can select the subfamily of k-dimensional oriented planes on which omega and the volume give you the same action. Of course, the, the larger this family is, the more interesting your calibration is gonna be because you can build more submanifolds that are volume minimizers because you have more freedom on how to choose their tangent planes. So you might have cases where this form has a family, an associated family that is possibly even empty or very small and then the, the calibration is less interesting. But Harvin Lawson gave a lot of examples where these families are large and give rise to interesting geometries. So I'm gonna sketch very quickly an example where the uh, where calibrations come into play and where what actually comes into play is uh, not a, a calibrated classical submanifold, but something that could possibly be very singular. And this is going to be a current, as you will see. So we are in a almost complex manifold of dimension four with a synthetic uh, structure. So this means, roughly speaking, that it's a four-dimensional manifold where if you select each tangent plane, you can choose a frame of uh, co a, a frame for a basis of the tangent plane so that in, su in this suitable coordinate, if you use this as standard basis, you basically see the standard of C uh, structure of C2. The, the word almost complex refers to the fact that you don't have holomorphic charts to cover your manifolds in a way that your almost complex structure comes from the one in C2. So point-wise, you always have the, what is the action of multiplying by i in C2. So you have this notion of endomorphism in the tangent plane that corresponds to multiplication by i. So the key feature is that if you do it twice, you get minus the vector you started from. But you don't have a way to recover it locally on a chart by starting from the structures of C2. So this is why you can't use complex analysis when you're facing such a uh, manifold. So there, is, uh, this, there are these two important uh, invariants that you can define on such a manifold. One is cyber witten invariance and one is Gromov invariance. So I can't possibly go into details, but uh, the definitions required in the first case for cyber witten invariance, they require you to uh, study the space of solutions to a certain elliptic system. And, stu and by studying this space of solutions, by a suitable counting of these solutions, you get your cyber witten invariance. And Gromov invariance, instead, they require you to count pseudolomorphic curves. So a pseudolomorphic curve will be the, al the analog of a of a, a, a holomorphic curve in C2. It's a, two a real two-dimensional curve in the four-dimensional manifold with the property that its tangent planes are invariant under the action of the almost complex structure. So they are, they would be complex planes in the standard C2, complex lines in the standard <coughs> C2. And what you require here is the same thing, but you don't have the standard complex structure. So these two invariants, if you just look at the formal definitions, they seem to share nothing at all. And it was very striking that Taubes was able to prove that in dimension four, with uh, an assumption on the Betty number of the manifold, these two invariants actually characterize the same manifold. So uh, they are the same invariant. Uh, the proof is really long and quite technical. Uh, I'm just gonna focus on one specific point that is connected to the discussion I want to, I want to deal with, and it's the following. So somehow you want to start from cyber and so you want to start from some solutions to this elliptic system and connect these to pseudolomorphic curves. So the strategy of Taubes at some point requires, in order to make this connection, to study a sequence of solutions to the elliptic system that you have. So these solutions are basically uh, maps from your four-dimensional manifold into C. And it takes some uh, suitable level sets, like a counter image of the origin of C. So these are two-dimensional manifolds. 
in the four dimension in the four dimensional ambient manifold and he passes these level sets to the limit so you have a sequence of two dimensional uh, smooth sub manifolds and you send these to the limit so what happens is that Taubes proves that they converge to a pseudolomorphic curve to a classical pseudolomorphic curve from a Riemann surface into your uh, four dimensional manifold and this will be the vague connection with the Gromov invariant so when you convert the Taubes written uh, you have a This? Yeah. It's a sequence. Like there is a parameter yeah, that you need to itself. there is a parameter you need to degenerate and that's how you get the sequence. When you, when you, when you degenerate, when you, what parameter are you moving to get the sequence? I mean, I, I guess these are elliptic, so if I don't have a parameter moving, I have a finite number. Yeah, so suppose Robert Whitney is S equals zero and you insert the study S equals some PR which goes to infinity. Okay. And you have a sequence of this R which goes to infinity. So the point I'm gonna dwell upon now is this one of the convergence. So you have a sequence of smooth submanifolds and you are sending it to the limit. So it's not clear at all in what sense they converge. And it's not clear at all why they should converge to something that is so nice as a pseudolomorphic curve. The, this one? Yeah, yeah this, is closed, this is closed and compact, yeah. So let's, let me give you a one-dimensional example to, to, to tell you what kind of trouble you can run into when you, make this, uh, when you try to make this limit. So each element of the sequence here is a curve, is a smooth curve. Um, you can imagine that you are in R3 and the two pieces that you see here are joined so that you have a unique smooth curve uh, uh, with one component, with one connected component. So the construction is done in this way. The blue parts converge to a counter set, and every time you remove an interval in the construction of the counter set, you fill in the gap with a smooth join, drawn in red. And every time you rescale the same red uh, object to the right scale, you need to make the join here. As you go on in the sequence, these two parts of the curve come closer and closer. And now you want to send this to the limit. So these are all uh, smooth curves without boundaries. So they're very nice objects. What happens if you, if you pass to the limit? So it uh, doesn't really matter which counter set you choose in the limit. For example, you can choose a counter set with positive measure. And what happens is the following. The blue parts coming from above and from below, since the, the, the two curves are uh, getting closer and closer, in the end they will uh, collapse together and they carry the same orientation. So somehow the blue part in the limit, the, the blue counter set in the limit will be counted two times. And you want to keep track of this fact when you pass to the limit. The other thing is that now the counter set is uh, totally disconnected. So whatever point you pick on the blue counter set in the limit, if you look in a small ball around this point, what you are going to see is not a smooth curve. It's not a smooth curve counted two times, it's just nothing that you can uh, call smooth because of these red parts coming together from above and below. And you have these red parts at any small scale around the point because the counter set is totally disconnected. So there's no way you can describe your limiting set as a smooth object in the limit. So this is, these points are what I'm gonna call singular points. It's those points such that no matter how small a ball around them you take, you are not gonna see your object as a smooth submanifold. So you must require some weaker notion of submanifold to pass to the limit in some sense. So these are the two things to keep in mind. You might want to count some parts of your set with multiplicities. For example, the blue counter set in the limit, you want to count it two times. And you must allow singularities. This is any, actually, fix ones for all the first uh, red, uh, red part. Yeah. And every time you remove an interval, you rescale that part to fit, to fit you here. So that you get a smooth curve at every step. Why am I removing it? I don't, I, I'm not, I don't understand why I'm removing it. Why are you doing this? So, 
so uh, what I'm giving is an example of smooth curves. Yes. So that when you pass to the limit, you can't possibly get anything smooth. And this is just how I construct them. So it, it, there's no dynamic involved. It's just the way I construct them. So when, whenever you want to allow a notion of limit, in this sense, you must allow these two things. Count things with multiplicities and allow singular points. Possibly many singular points, because uh, in this case, the whole counter set in the limit is made of singular points, and this has a positive measure. Now, to make formally sense of this, one uh, possibility is to appeal to the theory of uh, currents, and this is what we will do. So uh, the space of Deram currents is, by definition, just the dual space of compactly supported forms of degree of some degree k, and k is going to be the dimension of the current. So oriented submanifolds of dimension k naturally have uh, a, an action as continuous linear functional on differential forms of degree k. How do you get this action? So you just take your submanifold, you integrate a form on it, and this is a continuous linear function. So you have this embedding of oriented submanifolds into the huge space of the RAM currents. Now this space, however, is really huge, and fortunately we are not going to need all of it for the discussion. There's an important theorem telling you that if you have, a, you, that you have a, an intermediate space of currents called rectifiable currents with integer multiplicity that has a very good compactness property. If you take a sequence of elements in here with a uniform bound on their masses, so on their volumes and on the masses of their boundaries, then you remain in, the, in this set when you pass to the limit. So when I say pass to the limit, I'm taking the standard uh, uh, dual convergence, the weak star notion of convergence as a dual space. So that a sequence of currents converges if you get convergence every time you test on a specific differential form. And so we are happy because now when we want to send a sequence of oriented submanifolds to the limit, we know that we are going to end up in this space, which is hard to work with, but at least it's not the whole space of currents. So you have something at least a bit restricted. This uh, space of currents describes exactly the naive idea I tried to give before of an oriented singular submanifold with integer multiplicity. So it's uh, some kind of submanifold where you allow a lot of singular points and you have to also allow some multiplicities like what we had in the previous example. And it's enough to take multiplicities to be only integer values. So there are some pieces you might count once, some pieces you might count two times or five times, but integer numbers suffice. So let me be now more precise about what this singular submanifold is. The, the formal notion is that of a rectifiable set. So we have a a k-dimensional singular submanifold. Whenever I say this, I mean we have a, I don't know what I did. We have a rectifiable set of dimension k, which means the following. It's a, a set of Hausdorff dimension k. It has locally finite Hausdorff measure. And it has the following key property. You can pick almost any point on this set. When I say almost all, I mean with respect to the Hausdorff measure. And you can do the following procedure. You take a sequence of smaller and smaller balls around the point, no matter which sequence of radii you choose, and you dilate what is inside the little ball to the size of the unit ball. You dilate everything that is inside. And what you are requiring is that for almost every choice of the point that you've made, you will see here on the right that the sequence converges to the measure carried by a, by a k-dimensional plane. And this k-dimensional plane is uniquely determined. So for almost any point, you can do this procedure of dilations and get a plane in the limit, in the sense of measures. And this is what is called the approximate tangent to the rectifiable set at that point. So this is one of the characterizations of rectifiable set. The other one uh, that might but be more... It's always unique then, is it? So for almost every choice of the point, you have a unique plane. Exactly, that's the characterization. And the other way of characterizing rectifiable sets is to say that they are a union of countably many pieces of Lipschitz graphs. And that's where the fact that you have a unique tangent comes from because Lipschitz functions are uh, almost everywhere differentially. So this is the key requirement. And now remark that once you have an approximate tangent defined almost everywhere, 
you can still do the same thing as that you were doing with the standard classical submanifold. What we did in order to see a submanifold as a current was to integrate a differential form on it. And you can do it uh, the same because the pairing of the differential form and the approximate tangent is now well defined almost everywhere. And then you can do the integration on your rectifiable set because almost everywhere is enough to do it. So this is the formal notion of a singular submanifold we need to define rectifiable currents. And then once you have this, you can put some integer valued multiplicity function on the rectifiable set and get what we call rectifiable current with integer multiplicity. Anyway, possibly this uh, singular submanifolds can be very singular. The good thing about currents is that you have a, a, a very easy notion of boundaries. And of course, what you want to do is to generalize the classical notion of boundary that you have for a smooth submanifold. So for smooth submanifolds, you have Stokes' theorem. And now you just make Stokes' theorem the definition of boundary for a current. So you have a current of dimension k. You define the boundary to be the current with one dimension less, so that by duality, the boundary acts on form just by imposing Stokes' theorem. So this formalizes the fact that we saw in the example of the curve with a branch point that the boundary of that object is exactly the curve you cut. The, the, the branch point is not giving any contribution any at, at a boundary. So that's something you just compute and see. So we have a nice notion of boundary for currents. And whenever we will say cycles, we mean that the boundary is, the, the boundary is zero. So now going back to this uh, vague thing I was saying before. What happens in Taub's proof is exactly that when he sends these level sets to the limit, the kind of convergence he, may, he, he is able to make sense of is convergence in the sense of currents. So that he gets that these submanifolds converge in the limit to a rectifiable current with integer multiplicity and zero boundary. However, now this can be a very singular object as we've seen with quite a lot of tough estimates he's able to prove the following essential property for this limiting current. The approximate tangents that we know exist almost everywhere are pseudolomorphic, which means that they are invariant under the action of the almost complex structure. So you have an object that is possibly very singular, but with this extra property here. You have a very strong condition on the tangent planes. And then there is a lot of work, but this is the regularity theorem that you can prove. It was proved by Tubbs himself in this case and by Rivier and Tian in, an arbit in arbitrary ambient manifolds of arbitrary even dimensions. If you have uh, an, integer an integer multiplicity rectifiable current without boundary with this property on the approximate tangents, then you actually are a standard pseudolomorphic curve, which means a curve parameterized on a Riemann surface with values in two the manifolds. And possibly each curve is counted an integer number of times. It tells you that it's a very special current. It's actually a classical, classical. it's a classical pseudolomorphic curve. And that's what Tubbs needed in order to connect to Gromov invariance, to have a classical pseudolomorphic curve. But the regularity curve. was all on currents, basically. The regularity? The regularity was all on currents, which was yeah. the problem. S uh, so e essentially, the, the idea behind this process is that in order to make sense of convergence, and in order to make sense of convergence, you need the good compactness property you are forced to enlarge your space of admissible submanifolds. So you weaken the notion of submanifolds with that of a rectifiable current. Then you get some condition from which you can work back regularity a posteriori. So it's mm, something quite standard in analysis. You weaken the space of things you're looking at, like okay. Sobolev functions. Then you have maybe an elliptic system that you're solving and you work back regularity later. Okay, so I'm not at all doing justice to this proof because it's really lost. This is just a very naive sketch. But yeah, I, I also believe you that this is a very good estimate of the No. There are, uh, there's really a lot of estimates there. Okay, so now just to make things a bit more complicated, I'm going to give a more general definition. We've seen what a calibration is. Now we drop the closeness assumption. So I'm calling this a semi-calibration. 
and what I mean is that I keep only the fact that you have a good comparison of the action of omega with the corresponding volume element. So you have that omega is always has an action that is always bounded by that of the corresponding volume element, but we drop the closeness assumption. So if you, so in case the form is closed, we get the same definition as before of a calibration. So what, 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 what regularity are you assuming on the, on the form of calibration? So the form itself is a smooth form. It's a standard smooth form. But the objects that okay. have this property of having tangents in that special family might possibly be very irregular. So indeed, you can define an integer multiplicity rectifiable current of dimension k to be calibrated or semi-calibrated by such a form when you have that almost all its oriented tangent spaces belong to the special family where omega agrees with the k-dimensional volume. So we are just giving the same definition we gave in the beginning in the case of that special symplectic form. We are imposing that almost all approximate tangents, we know that almost everywhere they exist, they belong to this special subfamily. So omega and the volume do the same thing on the tangent plane to your, to your current. Except in the case of compaction, you scale it, you get more. Exactly, you can divide you by the, you can rescale it and, and get, but so the, the, the delicate thing is that if you're working with a closed form, a calibration, when you do that, you end up in a, in this setting, you're a semi-calibration, you lose the closeness. So the closeness would, was needed to prove that you are in, you're a minimizer of the area. What you, what doesn't matter from the point of view of uh, having a semi-calibration or a calibration is that it's always true that you can recover the volume of your current, or which is usually called mass of the current, by testing the current on the differential form. This is exactly what we saw in the beginning. So whenever you compute the volume or mass, you are integrating the volume element. If you are calibrated or semi-calibrated, integrating the volume element is the same as testing on the form that is the given calibration or semi-calibration. So you have this equality. This is exactly the equality we used when we proved that you are uh, an area minimizer. And you can do exactly the same thing for a current. We did it for a submanifold, you can do it for a current. If the form is closed, uh, if, it's, if you are a calibration, then calibrated currents are locally mass minimizers in their homology class. When you drop the closeness, of course, you lose this. There is an associated notion of almost minimality. So I don't have really time to go into that. It, it, you, you must allow an error term, basically, in the inequality you get. So it would be exactly the same proof for a current as it was for a submanifold. You have your uh, form that is uh, calibrated, uh, your current that is calibrated, T. You take a competitor in the homology class. So the mass of T is the same as the action of T on omega, which is the same as the action of S on omega if the form is closed. And you get that this is at most the mass by the requirement on the form. And if the form is not closed, you are not going to have this equality. You're going to have an error term here. So as you can see, the only thing you are using is the definition of boundary for a current. And this was Stokes theorem in the classical setting. I will point out during the talk uh, a couple of points where the fact that you want to look at semi-calibration, so non-closed form rather than calibrations might help. For the moment, let me give you a few more examples of calibration. So the only one I've given you so far is the symplectic form in C2. So you can do the same on an almost complex manifold endowed with, uh, uh, on a symplectic manifold endowed with an almost complex structure. You can take the symplectic form and you can take all of its powers suitably normalized. These are all calibrations. This is basically Wittinger's inequality, telling you that these are calibrations. Or you might do the same, dropping the closeness assumption on omega, and then you get semi-calibration. So this will be the most important example later on in the talk, so the, the one you should keep in mind. There are many more interesting examples, like the special Lagrangian calibration that you have in R2n. You identify R2n with Cn, and you take this form of degree n. So you take the real part of the standard holomorphic form. This is also a calibration, and you can uh, check the paper by Harvey and Lawson to see a lot of nice things about this. 
There is a non-flat analog of this calibration in Calabia Oenfold. If you take n equals three, this will be the explicit form of the calibration in real coordinates. And there are way more examples that you can look at, but I don't really have time to, to list them. So the one you should really keep in mind is, the, is this one. I will also mention this at some point, this special Lagrangian calibration in Arctic. So uh, let me just sketch again another problem where. Are special yeah? calibrations going to come back again? Or <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the it's going to come back in this setting. So basically the same thing without assuming that omega is closed. That's what is called the uh, almost Hermitian manifold. Uh, so in '96, Donaldson and Thomas uh, showed that there are very interesting connections between some invariants in complex geometry and the study of solutions to Young-Mills equation in dimensions higher than the usual four. Uh, the, the rough procedure in order to get the geometric invariants here is to make sense of a compactification of the space of solutions to this equation. So you want to study this space of solutions and make it a compact manifold somehow in order to be able to define invariants. So this is, in, in full generality, a very hard problem. There is a particular case when we have something. This was done by Tian in 2000. So as I was saying, the program is to compactify this space. And when you want to compactify this space, you have to take sequences of solutions and see what happens when you pass them to the limit. So Tian focused on some special kind of solutions to Young-Mills equation, what are called anti-self-dual instanton. And he proved, he proved that when you pass to the limit, you have smooth convergence away from a set of codimension four. So there's a set of codimension four where there is concentration of energy and you lose the smooth convergence in the limit. But this special set comes with an additional structure in this case. The structure is that of a calibrated integral current. Now, proving regularity for calibrated integral current then has a direct impact on, on knowing what kind of limits you have to allow in order to make sense of this convergence, and therefore you can go back to the compactification problem. <coughs> and again, the central issue in here is to understand how smooth this set is. If you can say that it's smooth enough, then you can compactify the space and go back to the first line. So now I'm going to describe a bit the state of the art regarding regularity questions for calibrated currents. So if you think of calibration so closed forms, we've seen that we are in, uh, in the setting where we are studying mass minimizers. So you can also look at things from the classical point of view of studying Plato's problem. You are studying the regularity properties of an object that minimizes the volume for a given boundary. So in the setting of currents, Almgren proved that uh, you, you ha if you have a mass minimizer, the singular set has co-dimension at least two inside the current. And this was done in the 70s. And then his student Chang improved this estimate in the case that your current is of dimension two. Adis. <laughs> yeah, Adis. <laughs> in the case that the current is co-dimension two, Chang proved that the singular set is not only co-dimensional twin the current, but it's made of singular points, of isolated points. So you only have, in the case of a two-dimensional mass minimizing currents, the singular set is made only of isolated points. Now this proof is, as you, there's somebody in the audience who knows this very well, uh, this, this proof is really long and hard to read. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Camilo and uh, Emanuele, they are, they are now rewriting down the whole regularity proof in a much shorter way with some new ideas and Camilo is lecturing on this now at Princeton. If we now move from the case of general mass minimizers to the case of just calibrated currents, if we think of the classical example of the calibration being the symplectic form, 
then we have complex currents in CN, and their regularity was done by King, Harvey Schiffman, Alexander, and Sue. They proved optimal regularity results, but the techniques only work in the case of complex manifolds. So if you want to move to the, for example, the pseudolomorphic currents that we needed in the proof of Taub's result, you need a new proof, and this, as I said before, was done by Taub's and Rivier Kian. So this is done in the case that you, uh, so Taub's did it in dimension four for the ambient manifold, and Rivier and Kian did it in the case of arbitrary even dimension for the ambient manifold, under the condition that the calibrating form is closed. So the case of a semi-calibration here is still open from the point of view of regularity. And the only other result I can mention is the case of special Lagrangian calibration. So it's the other one I showed you explicitly, the, the form of degree three I showed you before. But in a joint work with uh, Tristan Rivier, we proved that if we take special Lagrangian cones of dimension three, then the singular set is made of finitely many half lines emanating from the vertex of the cone. So this possibly gives you some intuition that if you restrict to cases of calibrated currents, you might be able to give more structure also to the singular set. So if you think of Almgren's result here, you would get that you have a three-dimensional current minimizing the volume, so the singular set is co-dimension in the current. So by using explicitly the fact that it was calibrated, we were able to actually show that the singular set is made of finitely many radial half lines, which is a better estimate on the singular set. However, oh, these are the only things that are actually done. So all the rest for the moment is speculation on the smoothness for other calibrations. Uh, so this point of view is asking how, how small is the singular set? That is to say, how much your current resembles a standard smooth submanifold? So it's this kind of regularity point of view. It's a local problem and you are asking how large the singular set can be. Uh, the problem connected to this is a kind of infinitesimal regularity question. So what we know is that we have a rectifiable current and thus we have a notion of approximate tangent almost everywhere. But there's a null set of points where you don't know that you have an approximate tangent and you might wonder what happened and if you are able to give a notion of tangent space at those points. So this is the question we are going to look at now. We are trying to see if there is a tangent space at any point of the current and what, it's, what it looks like and if it is uniquely uh, determined. So the, the definition of tangent space is just the same as the picture I gave you in the beginning. Now you pick any point on the current. You know that almost everywhere, if you do this, you end up with a plane there. But now you pick an arbitrary point. You might make these dilations and you wonder what happens. So already in this uh, sm uh, easy example, you see that in the limit you might get not a line, but two lines crossing, so a cone. So the two things you have to keep in mind is that the procedure of defining the tangent space is choose a sequence of balls shrinking around the point, make dilations and see what happens in the limit. And the second thing to keep in mind is that you might change the sequence of radii that you're choosing. And a priori, you might get different limits here. So the two things are you have to see if a limit exists. And then the second question is, if I change the sequence of radii by which I'm making dilations, do I get the same limit as before, or do I get a different one? So when, when it comes to calibrated or semi-calibrated currents, we can prove, and this was done by in the paper by Harvey and Lawson, that you can make sense of the limit at any point. So whatever point you pick on the rectifiable current, if you make these dilations for a certain sequence of radii, you can extract a subsequence. And the picture that we had uh, here on the right will have a well-defined limit. Not only you have a limit, but this limit is always going to be a cone. And it's always going to be a cone calibrated by the differential form evaluated at the point where you are around, around which you are dilating. So you do have a notion of tangent space at any point. Does that depend upon the sequence of radii? And so far it depends on the sequence of radii. And this is unfortunately the very hard question. So <laughs> Exactly, so what is the tangent now? <laughs> so yeah, different sequence of radii that you're choosing might a priori yield different tangent cones. 
and let's see, uh, first of all, what is behind the, the fact that you actually do have tangents up to subsequences. What's behind that is the monotonicity formula. So recall that the procedure you are doing is you are dilating this ball, and then you want to pass this to the limit. The mass of the current that you see in here, that I'm denoting like this, is the mass of the current in the little ball normalized by the corresponding disk, by the volume of the corresponding disk with this radius. So this is the, the volume of the unit k-dimensional ball, alpha. So this mass ratio is comparing the mass of your current inside the ball of radius r to the mass of the corresponding disk of radius r. And when you make the dilations, it's exactly the mass of the dilated thing. Now you can prove both in the setting of mass minimizers and in the setting of calibrated or semi-calibrated current that this mass ratio is monotone in R. When R goes to zero, this thing is weakly decreasing. And this gives you uniform bounds on the masses of what you have on the right there, so that you can pass to the limit by the compactness theorem that I mentioned in the beginning. So you can make sense of a limit up to extracting a subsequence. Wha the other important thing that this monotonicity formula tells you is that whenever you have a point in the support of a calibrated current, there is a contribution of mass coming from any ball that you pick around it. So if you're picking a ball around the point that actually appears in the current, there is a mass that is at least the mass of the disk there, of the corresponding disk of that radius. So this is basically saying that if a point is in the support of a calibrated current, it doesn't come with very little contribution of mass. It must bring contribution with it. And this is very peculiar to mass minimizers or calibrated currents. It's not true for general currents. You might just think of a, a surface with a cusp point. If you look at the area of this uh, surface restricted to a little bore around the cusp, and you compare it to the standard two-dimensional disk of that radius, this ratio is actually going to zero. Or if you think of a cone, that ratio will, will be in the limit to the uh, opening angle of the cone. But for this case, you actually get that the contribution is at least what, what would be the contribution of uh, the corresponding disk. So this is a vague symptom of regularity for this current. It, it cannot have points that come with no contribution of mass. And if you think of this from the point of view of the fact that you are a mass minimizer or almost a mass minimizer, you are saying that you are not wasting air area by putting that point in your current. So once you have monotonicity, you can do what we did before for a certain subsequence of radii and you pass to the limit and you get a cone and the cone is going to be calibrated by the form at that point. As you were pointing out, now if we change the sequence of radii, we might get different cones. And this is an example where I want to show how this can happen. So let's build this curve. It's a one-dimensional example. So you build a curve that oscillates a lot between two lines. So the oscillations go on infinitely many times uh, up to the center. You must choose the lengths in a way that the total thing has finite length, but you can arrange this. And now let's make two sequences of dilations. The first one is dilating with this choice of radii, and the second one is dilating with this choice of radii. And uh, the picture you would see if you made these dilations would be in the first case something like this. So as you can see, the oscillations keep appearing, but they keep appearing at smaller and smaller scales, and in the limit you just see the horizontal line. But if you do it for the other sequence of radii, you would get something like this happening, so that the other line appears in the limit. So as, uh, as you stay in the sequence, the oscillations, you keep seeing them, but you keep seeing them at very small scales, and they vanish in the limit. So now such an oscillating thing would seem a waste of area and you would expect that it doesn't happen for calibrated currents or for mass minimizers because you must minimize the area. But this is really just a naive idea. There's no way to, there's been no way so far to actually make sense of this and say, okay, the tangent cone must be unique. So there are only a few cases where you actually have uniqueness of tangent cones and they are the following. The case of two-dimensional area minimizing currents was done by Brian White. Then we have the result of Leon Simon. You have a tangent cone with an isolated singularity and multiplicity one. Then it is the unique tangent cone. And then in the setting of calibrations, 
uh, from Bergen and Rivier prove that for a two-dimensional integral current that is semi-calibrated, tangent cones are unique. So I will come back to this, uh, I will mention this again later. But for the rest, the problem is completely open. So the new uniqueness theorem for tangent cones I'm presenting is the following. So we are in an almost complex situation, as I described before. Uh, we don't need the closeness of omega, so it's uh, just a semi-calibration, so it's an almost Hermitian manifold, actually. And we take an integer multiphysics rectifiable current of dimension 2p, calibrated or actually semi-calibrated by this form. So it's a power of, the, of omega normalized by p factorial. And then we get uniqueness of tangent cones everywhere. So I was, as I was saying, it doesn't require the closeness. So now for the sketch of the proof of this theorem, I'm going just to focus on the case of the current being dimension two. So P would be one there. It's just calibrated by omega, or semi-calibrated by omega. <coughs> but the proof works exactly the same in higher dimensions. It's just for the sake of presentation. So let's start with this observation. We have this two-dimensional form. The tangent cones, we know that they are cones calibrated by the form at a certain point. So they're basically two-dimensional cones calibrated by a standard uh, synthetic form. Then by Wirtinger's inequality, uh, which I, we pointed out in the beginning, it means that the, the planes belonging to this special subfamily of calibrated planes are the hol holomorphic ones, where holomorphic is referred to the almost complex structure at the point you are dilating. So from this, it follows quite easily that any tangent cone at a point must be a sum of holomorphic disks, possibly counted more than once. So what we want to understand is we fix a point, we make this procedure of dilations, and we want to understand what tangent cone we get, if it's unique or not. So what we want to understand is which holomorphic two disks appear in the support of the limiting cone. So the space of holomorphic disks through uh, the origin of Cn is parameterized by Cpn minus 1. So what I'm going to use is an analog of the standard blow-up construction of uh, synthetic geometry or algebraic geometry, where you pass from Cn, you blow up the origin, and you move to the tautological line bundle on Cpn minus 1. And the uh, rough idea behind this is that if we had a current that is oscillating a lot between two different complex planes, you can't really measure the waste of area that you are having because these oscillations happen at very small scales and it's hard to measure it. If we are able to make this procedure of blowing up the origin and blowing up also the current, when and keeping in mind that in the classical setting of Cn, this map is holomorphic, what we get is that the red object we find on the right is going to have the property that the tangent planes are also holomorphic because the map is holomorphic. So something holomorphic here gets mapped to something holomorphic here. So if you just think of standard algebraic curves, you can do this and you get a holomorphic curve also on the right. Now holomorphic curve there, you can associate with the standard uh, synthetic form obtained from the Fubini's 2D form on Cpn minus 1 and the standard form on C. And the standard metric associated to the Fubini study metric on Cpn minus 1 times the standard flat metric on C. So you have a situation in which you are calibrated again. You are a holomorphic object calibrated by these new forms. And the advantage of seeing this from this point of view is that now the Fubini study metric will see the jumps from here to here. With uh, You have a very large estimate on the fact that you are actually jumping from here to here because there is a certain distance if you are oscillating between two planes and distance is kept until you reach this point. While here you were losing track of it because the oscillations were getting smaller and smaller, here you are able to actually see this loss of mass up to this level. So this is the naive idea behind it. So that you can say, okay, it can't be true that you oscillate between two different planes. The way you make it uh, uh, more formal and uh, you suit it to the situation of almost complex structures rather than the classical complex structure is the following. You must mimic somehow this blow up construction. So you need to use some embedded pseudolomorphic disks to the origin here. You can't really do it uh, all around the origin. You will just foliate a sector here. But it's enough for the construction to make it local. 
And what you get on the right will not be the standard structures on CPN minus one times C, but there will be perturbations of this, of the standard structure. So you will get a perturbation of the standard Fubini studi metric times flat metric, perturbation of the standard uh, complex, almost complex structures on CPN minus one and C, and perturbations of the classical Fubini studi form. And, and they're gonna be Lipschitz perturbations. So they're gonna be smooth away from this level. And the way you can actually make sense of joining them there is only to have them Lipschitz. But Lipschitz is enough basically for the monoto monotonicity formula to hold, which is all that we are going to need. So the map sending your current from here to here is well defined away from this point, And is, it is pseudolomorphic by construction. And now you want to define what happens to your current when you move it to the right, when you uh, transform it to the right also at the origin. So what you do is you cut a ball here so that your map is now a standard pseudolomorphic map. You map it to the right. You take this ball smaller and smaller. And now what happens in the limit? This is the question you have to answer. What you want to get is that you can make sense of the limit on the right. And not only you have a limit, but you have a limit without boundary. So <laughs> there is no boundary appearing when you close these things. So at each step in this construction, you are cutting a ball. So you are creating some boundary for your current that you will find here when you map it to the right. But what happens is that these boundaries cancel in the limit so that in the limit you get a cycle. So what you get is a semi-calibrated cycle on the right. And it's going to be a semi-calibrated cycle because of the fact that you are pseudolomorphic as a map. What is the reason that you get a finite map? Uh, so the reason actually comes, if you think of the explicit form of the monotonicity formula, the term on the right hand side that tells you the difference between the mass ratios at two different scales geometrically has the meaning of telling you what is the action of the, f the current you're transforming to the right on the symplectic form on the horizontal symplectic form so you know that that is finite so that this is finite too and the the action on the vertical is easy because you're not stretching in the vertical direction No, you do get finite mass, get finite mass. And, and so you can... Uh, but you don't exclude the oscillation directly because you get finite mass. No, no, you have to work more, yeah. And now let me point out that even if you start from a calibration, a closed form on the left, when you do this thing, you actually end up with a semi-calibration here in general. And that's why it's interesting also to know things about semi-calibrations, because you can use it. Anyway, now you have a semi-calibrated cycle here, and you want to show that tangent cones here are unique. So you start from a certain sequence of radii that you've chosen on the left, and say that there is a certain plane appearing in the limit, which will be transformed to this red plane. Now what uh, we will do is we choose any other sequence of radii to make the dilations, and we want to say that this red plane will always appear in the limit. So the way we do this is that we observe that, first of all, if that plane appears in the limit, at some scales, the current must come close to this red plane. Otherwise, it wouldn't appear in the limit. So possibly at other scales, it will be somewhere else. But there is always a sequence of uh, scales converging to zero where you do have some contribution there. So from the visual point of view, when we make radial dilations on the left, what we are doing on the right are vertical uh, dilations. So now we take an arbitrary sequence of dilations here, and possibly we might have a different plane appearing in the limit, but this plane will always see some points close to it at some small scales. Because when we dilate radial here, or equivalently vertical here, these points that were at some scales before, we will see them at some other scale, whatever dilations we make. So we always have some points here, no matter which dilations we are making. We might have them very, very close to, the, uh, to this black segment here, but we, we always have them. And now recall the monotonicity formula I told you. If we take a ball around the point here, the point where the red plane was crossing this CPN, minus one, since there are points in there that appear, there is a contribution of mass that is at least comparable to the disk of the corresponding radius. which means that you always have a contribution of mass in this ball of at least pi r squared, if the ball is dr. 
So we are sending this thing to the limit for an arbitrary sequence of dilations. We might be seeing this thing appearing, which we didn't see appearing in the beginning, but we know that there is always some mass in here, at least pi r square. Now the thing on the right is semi-calibrated. So as we pointed out, the mass is exactly the action of the current on the calibrating form. So this means that the mass passes to the limit. It doesn't vanish in the limit because we know that we have a convergence of currents here. Convergence of currents mean, means that when you test on a form, you pass to the limit. In this special case, we have the extra thing that testing on that special form that is calibrating gives you exactly the mass. So the mass goes to the limit. This same thing happens for mass minimizers, and, but it's very special to these cases. It doesn't happen in general situations where you might see loss of mass when you pass currents to the limit. So in this case, thanks to the fact that the mass has this meaning of being a test on a special form, you know that the mass passes to the limit. And therefore, whatever sequence of dilations you are making, once you get to the limit, you will see a current that has a contribution of mass inside this red ball, at least like, the, like pi r square. The extra thing you know is that in the limit, you will always get a cone here which is radial invariant, so that on this side you will always get something that is vertical invariant. So if there is a contribution of mass around any ball centered here, the only way to have this is that you actually have uh, this disk appearing, no matter which sequence of dilations is made. And so this tells you that that disk is appearing no matter which uh, choice of radii you've made. If you pull it back again, you have the original disk therefore appearing for any sequence of dilations. And this concludes the fact that that red disk we had fixed in the beginning for a special sequence of radii actually appears in the limit no matter which sequence of radii you are, you are choosing. So in this way you can fix once for all the support of the, of the tangent cone. You know that it's well fixed. You still have to argue a bit on the fact that maybe you have this disk counted two times and this counted once. And once you fix the, fix the support, you might have this discounted once and this discounted twice. So you still have to rule out the fact that multiplicities don't change from one cone to the other, but that is rather easy. And so this concludes the proof of the uniqueness in this case. So there is some extra work uh, you can do on this uh, current. Uh, so uh, for the case of two-dimensional pseudolomorphic current, you can address the same problem of dilating and converging to a tangent cone. What we saw is that this mass ratio converges monotonically to its limit, which is the density at the point. What you can ask is how fast this ratio converges. <coughs> and uh, always using this technique of uh, blowing up the origin, I obtained an explicit rate of decay for this. So you have a geometric rate of decay with an exponent depending on the density at the point. Very often in literature you have that uniqueness of tangent cones have actually been proved by proving something like this first, so that the mass ratio converges fast enough towards its limit, toward, towards its limit, which then gives you the uniqueness of tangent cones. And this is, for example, what Pumberger and Rivier had done in the, se in the case of semi-calibrated two currents. They proved the geometric ratio, like this but without the explicit exponent, and then they got the uniqueness of tangent cones. So the way they argued was to do it first for the case of pseudolomorphic currents and then approximate uh, a general semi-calibrated to current with pseudolomorphic ones. So for the moment, I've just given you the uniqueness of tangent cones independently of the mass ratio for a pseudolomorphic current and a posteriori this uh, rate of decay. So in general, then, it's okay to analyze the general algebraic devices of that dimension? For the other proof? I said it's in any dimension. And this one I've done it only in dimension two. There is okay, a so in the there other is one you analyze the general form which yeah. might be uh, any algebraic. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So wait, you already have the uniqueness of the Here I already have it and then I uh, I get this extra regularity, this extra rate of decay. Yeah. Which might be useful as a first step towards regularity, the study of regularity of the current in the case well, that that's Yeah, so this is why I was interested in this. But you can do sums as well, right? I mean, uh, in the two-dimensional case, yeah, the, the tangent cone is. 
the link with the sphere is a uh, sum of s hope circles. If you're in S3, you have, uh, yes. In that case, it's not very unique. You have a uh, sum of finitely many circles. Yeah, yeah okay, so that's. In S3, yeah. Also in SN, in, general, in, S in many S, terms. Yes, so I was sort of like yeah. worrying my mind about. Yeah, they're all shaped like that, yeah. And now the last thing I wanted to tell you is that, um, so as I was saying in the proof by uh, from Bergen and Riviere, they first approximate, they first do the pseudomorphic case and then approximate it, the general semi-calibrated case with pseudomorphic algebra. Now something I was very surprised to find out lately, and, and actually I'm very happy it holds, but I, ha I was very surprised, is that if you take an arbitrary semi-calibrated two-dimensional integral cycle, it is actually pseudomorphic for some structure. So recall that once you have this, you only have the same I calibration, it's a form of degree two, with the associated matrix. So you don't have an extra com almost compact factor. But actually you can put one that makes your current pseudolomorphic. And uh, I mean, what about like two totally different features? So this is a, lo a local, this is a local result, locally around the point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where? Where it cal yeah. Only calibrates. Yeah. And then can I have the tangent, my tangent, whatever? Uh, no, actually you can't. Actually this thing, it has nothing to do with the current itself. So when you do this thing, you forget about the current. You just look at your manifold with the two form that you're given and the matrix. Mm -hmm. And then you change the matrix and the form to some new ones that are still smooth, but they preserve the calibrated planes that you had in the beginning. Possibly they increase the calibrated planes so that you get more calibrated planes, but what was calibrated in the beginning will still be calibrated. So is it say, saying actually that the, 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 the by, by, by this lemma you could really... So what I'm saying is that... that exactly, yeah, exactly. Pseudomorphic or yeah. negative. Right. And then it also becomes interesting even more to study the case of regularity for a uh, pseudomorphic current that is semi-calibrated by a non-closed form, which is still open, because it, that would give you immediately the regularity for any semi-calibration of degree two. If you have, so when I say pseudomorphic, I don't mean that there is a closed form associated, <laughs> it's non-closed. So if you work it out, also the proof also for non-closed forms, then you have also the general semi-calibrated case. So what I'm saying is that what would seem to be a special case of a semi-calibration, that is a, a non-closed symplectic form with almost complex structure and matrix, can actually give you the full regularity result for semi-calibrations. Okay, I'm done. Um, so it's a combination of doing the, this blow up that I described. Now, for every S, right? this is for every R, yeah. So I mean, there's two ways to read this proof. I mean, there's either a vector field using stationary mm -hmm. and make it count as a part. Yeah, it's not that. Yeah. Did you use it? No. So that's the same that Brian White gets for the. This is the same that both right? Brian White and Tristan and David get. Right. So for instance, they, they do and compare. So here what, what I'm uh, actually doing is, yeah. So no, I don't have any epiphenometric inequality. What I have is that I have a geometric meaning for this and it's uh, connected to what you asked me earlier. So the fact that when you do this, the term that is describing you how much your mass ratio is far from its limit mm -hmm. is going to be the action of your current on the right on the horizontal form. So I have a geometric meaning for this. And now, while in the original picture, what you were testing in the, in the term in the monotonistic formula describing this is the action of your current on a form with a singularity at the origin. 
because you are dividing by r to the r to the square in the in the in the formula. Now here you have a standard form. It's the horizontal synthetic form. So you don't have the singularity in the form anymore. So it's way, way easier to do the uh, analysis estimates that are needed. And actually, alternately, you need Poincaré inequality to move from, uh, to do the standard Moray estimate from an, a ball and the annulus of the corresponding annulus outside. So what you would be comparing would be the mass ratio here to the mass ratio in an annulus. So you transform it to the right. You start from here, you integrate by part, and you get to the boundary here. Then you need some Poincaré inequality to move over. And the fact that it gets easier, it's exactly because you don't have this singular form anymore. You have something that is a standard form. You're acting with your current on a standard form. So that makes the estimates way easier. This proof? Yeah. It's exactly the same. So what you have in higher dimensions is that your tangent cones are still invariant under the action of the convex structure. So once you have a line, you have a whole plane. So you still want to characterize which planes appear in the limit. Although the tangent cone will not be a sum of these planes, it will be like an integration of these planes on a link that is higher dimensional. But still all you want to know is which planes appear. Because you, you say once you have that this plane is appearing, it must appear in all, it, in all the possible cones. Okay. It's exactly the same principle. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then you want all the planes which are actually appearing in your cone, and then there is one unique cone which is the cone of the yeah. So the, the two-dimensional planes live inside the limiting cone. Uh -huh. So the limiting cone is of dimension 2p, and you have these two-dimensional planes that describe the support of the cone as you let them go on a, on a higher dimensional link. But still all you want to know is which planes appear. And the proof is really it's exactly the same. So what you're trying to obtain is that uh, when you send the frequency of your unique solutions to the limit, the convergence, there is a set where there is energy concentration and the convergence is not in the CK sense. It's some weak W L two convergence. And there is accumulation of energy on this set. If you describe, if you are able to say that this set is smooth or quite smooth, then you know which kinds of weak solutions to your needs you have to allow in order to compactify the space of solutions. Because if the set is very regular, you, there's no way you can make that space compact. There is too much things you need to add. So you've been giving a course, I guess, right? So the set of only possible candidate can terms is linked circles. Right. Yeah. So uniqueness will then follow from Allard onto 1980. Right. Yeah. And if you have that estimate and you plug that into Allard. Yeah, that's what I was uh, looking at now. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if there could be some other way of doing it too, maybe easier. I don't know. I have to think about it. It's conceivable you could vary Schwartz Simon's argument. Yeah, that would help a lot. Stick your estimate in. You might get it. Yeah. It might be. Yeah. Is your all no. Anyway. Well, it, it would be nice if you thought about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably not worth your time. You should just write a little message. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it is a fact that <laughs> by using one, yeah. and that is all I have to say about it. <laughs> Are you here all week? Huh? Are you here all week? Oh, yeah. We're trying that. Oh, this, uh... Now, you do have to check one thing. You have to check that the number of Jacobi fields on one of these circle things is equal to the dimension of, of the family of circles, which is... Mm, oh, gotta be yeah. the case. Okay, yeah. Right, it's gotta be the case. Yeah. Right? Because that's the condition in Allard Ongren is... That's <laughs> is that still long, right? Yeah, <laughs> to tell you this. Every tangent term, being a little sloppy, uh -huh. is the cone on a submanifold. Okay, mm -hmm. which submanifold? So, so. So you, you got you got all these minimal submanifolds of this field. Okay, yeah. every minimal submanifold has got Jacobi field. Okay, yeah. and the dimension of the set of Jacobi fields has to equal the dimension of the family. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, what happens in general when you use an implicit function argument is that if you look at take any minimal submanifold of a sphere, mm -hmm. okay, it sits as a real in it, the family of nearby guys. Yeah. sits as a real analytic set in a natural way in the family of Jacobi fields. Okay? But it could really be a real analytic set and not the whole thing. So it has to fill it up. Yeah. And that's the condition. <laughs> yeah, in fact, if you take the product of three circles, mm -hmm. three circles, that's a bad one. In F3? In No, no, well, so where's the thing? But yeah, yeah, in R6. Uh, right. yeah. I think that's right. I think and that's right. the best one. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, yeah. it's even softer Why? than I actually. Yes, yes, yes. So if I have to be honest, <laughs> since you're using Nash, you're going to be better. You can definitely go. Yeah. So, right, yeah. so, 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 you know, so the, now the technique so isn't. So we, we, we kind of start from somewhere. Uh, but as Brian White pointed out, it's more explicit. You actually get the K. With a number of which is probably not best possible. Uh -huh. You know, there's a power of R, which is. So have you also been thinking about order or not? We're still, we're still, we're here starting on the slide. Four, yeah. uh, <coughs> so does that it mean that the shortest four? The last one? Yeah, for me, the thing is the four. Yeah, the high level of the is the main thing. That's what, what I was going to ask you, uh, Sergio, was because, I mean, the other but argument so that, we you, have that you did before, yeah, yeah, the other I mean, argument it, it proves to me uh, that it's just pretty robust in the sense that it doesn't give you any lessons. But you're, you're working on that. Yes, right? I know. So I the, the high level example uh, is really uh, one level. It's something like that. The, the kind of thing you would want. Mr. Farrell uh, can't really uh, work it out. Yeah, what to do is you take y of x i is equal over the star, yeah. and just see what happens in the analog of the index between r and the r, to compare the two matrices. Uh, so you're substituting this r times the end of the index, and then somehow that's why you can see what kind of <laughs> Uh, 
It's kind of like you have to compare. Like, <laughs> no, I have to, 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 to